its coexistence. We can't survive as a human race without all the other things that make the world go round and help produce the food that we consume. Hello and welcome to our series, Exploring Biodiversity and Farming. I'm Tom. And I'm Emily. In this series, we're taking you on a journey through the world of biodiversity right at the heart of agriculture. We'll be exploring the vital role biodiversity plays in farming. It's not just about the variety of life, it's about the health of our ecosystems, the sustainability of our food sources, and the future of farming. We're digging into the practical aspects too. How can farmers transition to more biodiversity-friendly practices? What support is out there, and what does the future hold? Together, we'll explore the innovative solutions and fresh perspectives, shedding light on how we can all contribute to a more biodiverse and sustainable future. So Emily, who are you, where do you work, and why do you care about biodiversity? I am Emily. I work for Agri Epicenter as the sustainability analyst for AgriTech. I'm from California, if you can't tell. And I went to uni at University of California, Davis, which is one of the biggest agricultural schools in the world. I studied biosystems engineering. And then when I ultimately moved to the UK, I got in touch with Agri Epicenter and the rest is history. So I've worked at Agri Epicenter for the last four years, and before I became an analyst and started working more specifically in sustainability, I was helping to manage projects and implement technology on farms. And that's really where I got my love of farming and really wanted to represent farmers well and advocate for the farmers that I think are doing a lot of amazing work who don't necessarily get acknowledgement for the hard work that they do. So I'm Tom. I work at the Agri Epicenter, focusing on sustainability. I am a passionate advocate for sustainable and regenerative agri-food systems. I stumbled into the world of agriculture and farming after spending some more time on our family farm and wanting to better understand how farming in the UK was going to work going into the future which led me to study my master's at the Royal Agricultural University in Agricultural Technology and Innovation before, like a lot of people, catching the soil health and regenerative bug. And ever since then, I've worked to try and understand and communicate this intersection between technology and innovation, real world farming, and the sustainability and regenerative movement. So you and I both work for AgriEpi, which is part of the UK Agritech Centres. And our role is to bridge that gap between the innovation technology community and the farming and agricultural community. And really, we're here to try and help drive forwards productivity and sustainability through innovation and technology in the farming and agricultural sector. Yeah, bridging the gap. In this first episode, what we're trying to do is get a better understanding of the complex relationship between biodiversity and farming. So Emily, where are we kicking off this journey? Well, I think we need to start on the farm. We're going to speak to some farmers and some academics about the importance of biodiversity on farm, what that means, and why it's important. (laughs) Monsters, aren't they? I mean, I'd be scared if I ran into them in, in the dark. You, you wouldn't want to be lifting them up to shear the damn thing. <laughs> so I went down to Stratton Farms, who you know well. And while I was there, I managed to pick up some conversations with a couple of other innovation farmers, where I was just really keen to understand what biodiversity means to them. My name's Rob Addicott. We farm just south of Bath, farming in partnership with a neighbour, Jeremy Padfield, and we are mainly arable, but Jeremy has beef and I have sheep. So one of the things that I got from speaking to Rob was that he's clearly recognised the value that encouraging insect biodiversity has on his farm and its ability to regulate itself. As a farmer who is focusing on that, maybe not as much as some, but more than most, I would say, we're doing that because we believe that it's important to have the biodiversity so that we're not becoming reliant on chemicals to do a job which nature will do itself over time. I was out scouting a field with a drone, as you do, and we had been looking, the agronomist and I, as to whether the flea beetle had laid their larvae in the plants and we could see that the larvae had got into the plants but there were no larvae there and whilst I was out with the drone I was absolutely covered with ladybirds Mm. and I'm convinced that the ladybirds had been predating the larvae of these Now, for me, that's a huge benefit 
Like if I've created an environment on our farm where natural predators are coming and sorting out this, which is a huge problem for us, then it's win-win for me. And there's a lot of failed rape crops around and we have a, a decent established rape crop. And I'm not saying it's completely down to that, but it's got to help. That was a lovely story from Rob about ladybirds. I mean, what do you think about that? I think it's really interesting and exciting that he is seeing that biology can replace chemistry in some ways. So instead of having to use pesticides, he's got ladybirds who are solving his problems for him. And I just think that's such a good example of this move towards farming with nature instead of against it. Yeah. And it's funny because like, obviously, we've had so many conversations for this series with farmers and then outside of this podcast. And anecdotally, we've heard these kind of stories. I guess that's probably one of the reasons why we then wanted to reach out to someone to understand if this is more than just anecdotal. So specifically, we spoke to Natalie Duffus, who's a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And she's been busy investigating the ecological outcomes on biodiversity net gain. She taught us a whole lot about we beasties. <laughs> In fact, that was a really nice thing about speaking to Natalie was just her like incredible passion for insects and invertebrates. I think there's an incredibly frustrating kind of loop there with insects and their perceived problems and also pesticides. So if you have a really large pest outbreak and you're inclined to use pesticides to control it, you will do some damage to the pests, but also you'll do some damage to the, the things that would typically feed on those pests and kind of in the long term potentially exacerbate that problem. Whereas if you are not using these chemical inputs, these pesticides, you can start to build a, a healthy population of predators, which will kind of keep the pest species in check. So when we're speaking about biodiversity, I think it's really important to understand there's two components. There's diversity and abundance. So diversity being the number of different species and abundance being how many of those species are present in the ecosystem. Natalie's research primarily involves studying insects, and through her work, she directly measures the diversity and abundance of insect species on farm. While listening to Rob's Ladybird story, we learned about how biodiversity on farm can perform a function, in this case, pest control. But we were also curious about the other functions that biodiversity can serve. It can't be understated how important it is to both the ecosystem that it occupies and also to us. So thinking about those agricultural habitats, you have a whole host of insects which kind of depend on that habitat to live and to thrive. But then also they provide us with significant benefits with insects and invertebrates. You can look at several different functions. So you have pollination, you have your bumblebees, your butterflies, hoverflies. Thinking about earthworms, they provide soil structure. Thinking about decomposing invertebrates such as wood lice, they speed up the return of nutrients back into the soil. And things like predatory ground beetles and spiders, they provide us with this kind of free pest control, controlling things like aphids and slugs and caterpillars. So they always say that carabid beetles are a gardener's best friend. Um, and you can kind of have that on the, the agricultural scale by having the beetle banks in the field where you have this raised ridge, which beetles love. And you kind of have carabid beetles moving around and eating eating the things that you don't necessarily want on the crops. There's loads of linkage between all of these different components. So the importance of biodiversity is, is intrinsic and it has its own value. But also the, the functions that it provides to us as a society is, is also incredibly important and can't be, can't be underestimated. So I think it's worth noting that while researchers do have lots of evidence of the functions that different species carry out, and we hear anecdotally that improving biodiversity has benefits for farmers such as pest control that we've just talked about more research is definitely needed to quantify and demonstrate these effects across different contexts but what we hear so far is like clearly really promising yeah i completely agree however the overall picture of biodiversity across the uk isn't quite so promising in general terms in the uk biodiversity is not having a very good time Really interesting documents like the State of Nature report show that many of our species are declining, both diversity and abundance. And we have 
quite ambitious targets to turn that around and start gaining species abundance in our environment improvement plan. But at the present moment, I, I would say things are in a slightly worrying state. So I think there is a real need to address the state of nature in the UK and kind of make some some big changes to conserve those species. So recognizing the importance of biodiversity as a whole, some farmers in the UK are making biodiversity a key focus of their work. One of our innovation farmers, Sophie Alexander, who we have worked with really closely on this, has actually adopted enhancing biodiversity on her farm as a bit of a personal mission. I farm in Dorset. It's called Hemsworth Farm. It's about 1,200 acres, and it's now a wholly organic farm with a little more land that I've rented going into conversion. And three years ago, we established our own dairy herd. We've been a mixed farm for a while, but we were using other people's livestock on the system. And we're now milking about 260 cows, as well as growing arable crops. For Sophie, farming a mixed system emerged quite naturally as a solution to some of the challenges of farming organically. As you probably know, organic systems always have an extended rotation. In order to build the fertility, we always are using legume lays for a period of the rotation. And I also happen to be on very light land. It's basically chalk with some loam about 40 centimetres on top. So it's hungry. And in order to have long-term fertility building lays, I really need a product while that land is out of production. So not only am I producing milk, which is a, a source of income, to, we'll leave how profitable dairy is for another conversation, but it does generate cash. And also the animals are vital for rehabilitating the biology and life in the soil, which you can't replicate in any other way. You can't replicate that with even artificial fertilizer. You can get your nitrogen, but it has a very different dynamic with the soil. So incorporating dairy onto her farm has allowed Sophie to have more financial resilience, but she actually thinks that the organic farming and grazing cattle has improved the physical resilience of the farm and the soil itself. I do think that running the farm as an organic enterprise is making a big difference to the soils as well as the above ground biodiversity. And the cattle are rehabilitating this farm, which was at a very, very low ebb when I came here 12 years ago. It had been hard used. They are hungry soils anyway, but it had been really mined. And that is the predicament of many farms, well, all over the world, but in the UK. And so these labels, agroecology, regenerative, we need labels because we've got to call them something. But the flip side of that is that they can be divisive. And the restoration of our natural world alongside food production needs to rehabilitate and restore biodiversity as well, because they're literally one and the same thing. We seem to have separated them, but you know, we're paying the cost now. So I don't think it is either or. It's not either food or wildlife. They're not mutually exclusive. They can coexist. And we now have quite a number of species who are well adapted, for instance, to arable systems. Emily, what's really cool about Sophie, as we both know, is, I mean, she's a first generation farmer and 12 years in farming isn't a long time. But the transformation that she's overseen in that period is been kind of amazing. So clearly this goes far beyond just the resilience of her farm. Gosh, where does one begin? It's coexistence. We can't survive as a human race without all the other things that make the world go round and help produce the food that we consume. So I think some people perhaps are under the impression that it's just oh a bit sad to lose a species from the animal kingdom, we won't see it again. But that is only a tiny part of the story. 
And everything has its place and role to play in the ecosystem. It's not always the above ground mammals that people can easily empathize with. It's the microorganisms beneath the surface of the soil or in the soil, in the earth, where life really begins. And the unintended consequence of this kind of miracle where we've produced so much food for the last 70 years is that inadvertently it's caused decimation to soil organisms. Preach it, girl. <laughs> Hallelujah. I find what Sophie said about the importance of biodiversity on a larger scale just so inspirational. But it does lead you to think, why did we ever lose sight of biodiversity in the first place? And I think that's exactly why we reached out to Louise Manning, who is a professor of sustainable agri-food systems at Lincoln University, to try and give us a bit more context on this. We have to reflect on the fact that starvation was an ever-present challenge for communities in Europe post the Second World War. So there was a real drive to end food rationing, to be able to make a wider range of food available and to produce food for an ever-growing European population. The challenge is that trade-off between producing safe, affordable food and its impact on the environment. But after decades of this, we learned from Louise that things are starting to change. What we've seen, especially over the last 20 years, is the rise of corporate social responsibility as well as having legislation to address the impact of food production on the environment. That corporate social responsibility has now evolved into what we would call ESG. And as we've seen the rise of concern over factors such as climate change, biodiversity loss, we're also seeing that supranational engagement where we have a lot of our future policy, both for business and governments, being driven through either climate change COPs or biodiversity COPs. And those are having impacts right now on businesses right across the UK and in Europe as we start to look at how we're going to deliver on the promises. Yeah, so Emily, it's clear that there's an increasing pressure on farmers, just like all businesses, to engage with sustainability more broadly and biodiversity specifically. Right, but farms already provide many more ecosystems compared to developed land. And my thought is, is it really farmers' responsibility solely to improve UK biodiversity? They obviously have so much up against them already. Farmers are already working with incredibly tight margins and to impossibly high standards. And it's a lot to put on them, really. So I worry that the response will be poor from farmers if we try to tell them that it's their job to solely fix a problem when they are already just trying their best to provide food for a constantly growing population. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is obviously something we should cover in later episodes about whether or not we can expect farmers to be taking this biodiversity on on the already extensive list of things they have to do without any extra reward. Definitely. I want to make sure that the industry at large and the population at large isn't scapegoating them for all of our problems that we have created as a population. And instead, just empower farmers to do what they think is best and find what works for them. Yeah. And I think what was great about speaking to Louise is that she clearly outlined the fact that biodiversity is not just a problem for farm and farmers. And it's actually a much bigger problem more broadly than this. We're seeing so much of our land, which is supporting uh, nature and biodiversity, going under concrete right now in the UK. And for me, who spends a fair bit of time visiting different parts of the UK, to just see how much of our former farmland is going under concrete does create a concern for me in terms of its impact on biodiversity. Biodiversity isn't just about farmers. We've all got to come together. It's just as much about how we have urban living as we do rural. And food production is only one part of the impact that we're seeing on biodiversity. 
So Tom, I think that instead of imposing this on farmers as a responsibility squarely on their shoulders, we need to reframe it as an opportunity for them. And I think the shift from the extractive nature of industrial farming into a more biological one is an amazing opportunity for farmers and something that they can really embrace. Over 70% of UK land is farmland. So if we can get this right, farming can have a massive impact on increasing the nation's biodiversity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we also need to remember that there is an inherent benefit to increasing biodiversity for the farmers themselves, increasing the natural capital of the land and potentially the productivity of that land as well. It's something that farmers can be really proud of. So at this point, we've spoken to a couple of our innovation farmers, Rob and Sophie, and heard from them about the benefits of building biodiversity on farm. We continued to speak to Natalie and heard from her that there are many ways that farms can improve their biodiversity and also some of the benefits of these. A really important one I've seen a lot of is this hedgerow regeneration. So the data has shown that since the 1950s, we've been taking out and reducing our total hedgerow stock. And hedgerows are just incredibly, incredibly important for a whole range of things. So ground nesting birds, they are big users of hedgerows. Also things like butterflies, the brown hair street butterfly, beautiful species that loves hedgerows. So the putting back of these hedgerows into farmland, I think, is so important and, again, provides dual benefits to both biodiversity and and the farmer. And then seeing different grazing regimes is also really interesting. So you have to get that quite right for biodiversity. And in a lot of systems, there can be kind of an overgrazing and then you don't get as many things flowering as you would like. Whereas if you kind of have this nice rotation of grazing, you can allow things to flourish and bring in those insects before then grazing later in the season. The use of field margins is is absolutely fantastic. There are some absolutely brilliant species that occupy field margins. So kind of lovely wildflower strips are amazing. We've seen the bombardier beetle, Brachinus crepitans in there. And then there's also a species of beetle that depends on Brachinus crepitans. It's called Ancominus dorsalis. It unfortunately doesn't have a, a snappy common name. But we would actually consider that species to be something of an arable specialist. So we see it very frequently in these field margins, which kind of signifies how how important they can be. And we've also found species which are new to science in these arable field margins. So there was a species of sheet web weaver spider, which was found in an arable margin in Cambridgeshire. And we haven't found it anywhere else yet. So I think that's like really exciting and interesting that, you know, farming can bring these biodiversity benefits to the point where we have these species that they don't just tolerate these habitats, they, they kind of thrive in them. And of course, the big thing in terms of being sympathetic to nature and biodiversity is reducing those chemical inputs. Seeing that transition to kind of a, a chemical-free style of farming or as, as little input as possible, you kind of start to see these species come back. Things like lizards, more bumblebees, more butterflies, like it is just a fantastic thing to see. What I think is so cool about this bit of Natalie's interview is that she was talking about how over time farmland has actually become its own ecosystem for different insect species and biodiversity as a whole, obviously. And I asked her a question at one point that was just like, obviously, if we could go back in time and not deforest at all and keep everything the way it was, that would be the most ideal scenario. But We are where we are, right? Like 70% of the UK is farmland. And the biodiversity and ecosystems of the UK have adapted to fit that. And so now we're actually seeing that there are unique species that are specifically adapted to living in arable fields or other types of agriculture. And I think that's something that needs to be protected and built upon. I mean, absolutely. I found that whole conversation with Natalie fascinating and also the points that she made about how undervalued biodiversity is within farming and agriculture compared to, let's say, a rewilding project or, you know, New Moorland. And the fact that she demonstrated that we've seen equally impressive biodiversity gains on arable land 
as we have done in some massive rewilding project. I think that farmers get a really bad rap when it comes to biodiversity. But perhaps if we were to share facts like these, and especially facts like these with farmers themselves, they might actually be a bit more motivated to engage with the process of improving biodiversity, not only because they would get funding for it, but because they feel like they're doing something positive for the environment. I think there's this whole point where farmers as a whole and particularly conventional farmers have been seen as these destroyers of biodiversity. And there must be a huge frustration around feeling like that when, as to your point earlier, they are the stewards of the land and they more than anyone want to make sure that the land and the ecosystems within that are in a good place. And by being able to get this message out there that actually farming and agricultural land do and can have amazing biodiversity, if they could feel much better about that, you're quite right. I think they'd feel much more open to engage in field margins and better hedgerows. Whereas in the current context, sometimes it's put out as, you know, quite a transactional payments thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think vilifying farmers for anything, vilifying anybody is not the way to get them to do what you want. And especially with the amount of pressure that farmers are under already, all of this biodiversity work and transforming their farmland into more species rich areas is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. And that's something that farmers don't have. Farmers are notoriously time poor, very, very busy all the time, working 18, 20 hour days sometimes and worrying about biodiversity isn't their main priority. I think you're so right. And when you talk about time, there's the amount of time that they have to put into these kind of projects. But there's also the amount of time it takes sometimes to get results back. I was speaking yesterday to a couple of people involved in the Devon Silvo Pasture project. And, you know, they're a few years into that now, looking at different ways to integrate trees and coppices into commercial livestock production. But, you know, that project in theory, is looking to go on decades, not years. And so you've got time pressures in the way that you're talking about. And then you've also got just long, long time pressures to try and see the effects of some of these biodiversity projects. When you're not sure what your yield will be this season, it's very hard to think about what your biodiversity will look like in 20 years. Yeah. Despite Sophie's passion for biodiversity, she is, at the end of the day, a farmer who is producing food. And she reminded us the bottom line. I think it is a responsibility of anyone who gardens or farms or has anything to do with wildlife to optimise the conditions for it to be as healthy and prolific as possible. What must never, ever be overlooked, which is really the essence of sustainability, is whoever manages land, it has to be financially viable. And as I think we all know, few people know their own businesses better than those running them. And I guess that's why Sophie advises against blanket advice or prescriptions. I think our tendency, just as people, is we want a solution. That's a solution. I can move on. And there is no one solution. And we're talking about an entire ecosystem. So just in terms of farms, I think it has to be a whole farm system. And some farms won't sequest a great deal of carbon because they're on sand. But they might be very good at nurturing certain creatures above or below ground or doing something for water systems or reducing pollution Different things are appropriate in different places, and we can't all move at the same speed. I just want to introduce the idea of the binary between organic and conventional farming. As Sophie says, people really like to think good or bad. They like to think in boxes. They like to have a solution. But organic and conventional isn't so straightforward. It's not just eco-friendly or eco-terrible. There's a lot that conventional farmers can do to increase biodiversity and give back to the land. And there's a lot of things that organic farmers can do that are actually not very healthy for the land and not encouraging biodiversity. It's not a one size fits all approach. There is actually something that every farmer can do and perhaps every landowner can do to encourage the increase of biodiversity on their land. Emily, I couldn't agree with you more. And as you well know, like I spend a lot of time advocating for regenerative and 
agroecology but one of the things that i've realized speaking to lots of different people farmers and people further up the food chain is that if we make it too binary and too prescriptive we can put off a lot of farmers and really what we need to be encouraging is all farmers to do a little bit of improvement where they can and where it's suitable for their particular farm enterprise completely agree tom i think that labels can be really ostracizing sometimes but they do serve a purpose we do need flexibility and everybody needs to do their bit. But labels and standardization can help us to understand where we are and where we want to be in terms of biodiversity and just environmental stewardship. For Louise, finding that balance between standardization and flexibility means ultimately a change in culture. I think if we can develop the technology to be able to demonstrate that for a specific range of outcomes, that those outcomes have been delivered irrespective of the practices that have been employed, then potentially we have a way to demonstrate that there are many ways in which you can deliver a resilient farm. There are many ways in which you can deliver biodiversity restoration on your farm or as a group of farmers within your landscape. But that presents a whole new way of thinking across the sector and also requires a whole level of trust. So you go beyond saying, has your sprayer been MOT'd? How many training certificates have you got? And that kind of transactional way to then say, right, do you have to demonstrate a set of outcomes on your farm in terms of safe food, caring for nature, embedding the environment within your business model? And we are just going to look at the outcomes. How many different species of butterfly have you got? in your pollen and nectar mix? What is the range of species that you have? How are you looking at those corners of your farm that aren't very productive? And what's right for you in your business model? So Emily, that brings us to the end of our inaugural episode. I think we've had fun exploring the role of biodiversity in farming. And I've really enjoyed some of the stories we've had. I think what's been really interesting and one of the main outtakes for me has been that every farm is different. The approach they need to take to this is going to be unique and the speed at which they approach it is going to be different and unique. But we do need some reliable way to measure in order to manage. Absolutely agreed, Tom. We can't expect people to do something when we don't even know if it's working. So how can we expect farmers to try to improve their biodiversity if even after years of trying, we can't tell them explicitly that they have or have not done it? I mean, we see this a lot across agri-tech, you know, why do we need to measure? And like fundamentally, we need a baseline and we need to see whether we're improving or making things worse. And I think that's something which we need to come on to and understand better and investigate how that's possible to do in a viable way economically. And as you pointed out, time-wise for these time-poor farmers. So in our second episode, we're going to dig deeper into emerging technologies and innovations that are helping us to accurately measure biodiversity on farms. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next episode. I love talking about tech, and I think that we had a lot of really great conversations that I'm happy to share with the audience. So see you in episode two. This podcast was made possible by AgriEpicenter. It was hosted by Thomas Slattery and Emily Laskin and was produced by Ben Weaver-Hinks for CoFruition. To learn more about anything that you've heard or to reach out to work with the agri Center, you can contact us via our website. For further resources and links to topics discussed, please check out the show notes. We really hope you enjoyed this podcast and found it interesting and valuable. We certainly enjoyed making it. If you did, we'd be really grateful if you could subscribe and share it with people in your network who might want to hear it too.